Good morning. Welcome to worship. Nice to see all of you here today. Welcome to our guests, our visitors, those of you who are joining us online. We're, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, I'm just curious, what do you enjoy most about being part of a church, about being part of a congregation? What is it that you enjoy? Fellowship. Get to be around other Christians. Anything else? Hearing about, thank you, good. Hearing about Jesus. We like hearing about Jesus as a group. What else? What else do you like about being part of a congregation? Friendship. Friendship. Friendship, fellowship, hearing about Jesus, being around fellow like-minded Christians. One of the things that we're going to talk about today, the main focus of what we're going to talk about today, is the as part of the benefit of being part of a congregation, is that of church discipline. Raise your hand if you like practicing Christian admonition. I'm shocked that nobody raised their hand. But it's such a necessary thing for us to do. Uh, because we all, we all fall short. And, and we all have our blind spots. And, and at times we need help. We need brothers and sisters in Christ to admonish us and correct us. And, and we thank God for that wonderful blessing in Christian fellowship that we have that as part of a family of believers. And we give thanks to God that he gives us that opportunity to do so. So that will be the focus in our worship here today in word and song. We'll join in singing our opening hymn, Chief of Sinners Though I Be. May God bless our worship here today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, as we approach our holy God in worship, we must confess the sin that surrounds us, fills us, and separates us from him. We ask him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, 
for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, we praise the Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from Ezekiel chapter 33. There's, there's two things that I would hope you take away um, just to focus your attention in on this lesson. One is that even though God punishes evil, that is not his desire. God absolutely does not want anyone to be cursed with hell. God does not want anyone to be banished into eternal darkness. He does not want that at all. He wants all people to be saved. And secondly, he's called you. He's called you to be a watchman. You, to, to, when you see that danger, to call that out. To, for you to ring that warning when there's sin in someone's life. So that way they can avoid that punishment of hell. He's called you and I to do that. A lesson from Ezekiel 33. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved." 
son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? This is God's word. Our second lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia, chapter 2. Um, so the apostle Peter, he at one point had started eating with Gentiles, with non-Jews. And he was associating himself with Gentiles by eating some of the food that previously um, God, under ceremonial law, had declared it to be unclean. Uh, but then there were some Jews that came up from Jerusalem and uh, when they saw Peter doing this and Peter noticed that they were watching him, he started to kind of pull away from the Gentiles that he'd been eating with and this caused other people to start to sin too, that they thought that it was somehow wrong by associating yourself with Gentiles. Now, Paul, when he sees this happen, he actually goes and he addresses it with Peter. He rebukes him. He says even into his face, he said it publicly. Um, and, and that might be required of us at times too. When there is a public sin, that requires a public admonition so that way other people aren't misled, that way other people aren't, aren't, aren't led astray. Uh, the example I used to use when I taught uh, in high school was that if, if there was a student who in the middle of class, you know, stood up to me and called me out on something or made fun of me in some way, I didn't wait until after class to address it with that student one-on-one. -on -one. Why not? I, I had to address it right there publicly and put that kid back in place so that way everybody knew that's not how you treat your teacher. That's not how you act. And so the same is true when it comes to a public sin. It requires a public admonition. So when Cephas, that's another name for Peter, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is God's word. Our Holy Gospel for this Sunday is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 18, beginning with the 15th verse. Out of respect for the words of our Savior Christ Jesus, please stand. This will serve as the basis for our sermon later on. Jesus here says to us today, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. This is the gospel of Christ, our risen King. We join in our confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite the small children to come forward for the children's message. Morning. 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 Good to see you guys today. How's everybody doing? Good. Did you do anything fun this weekend? What'd you do? Anything fun? You're going to go swimming? Nice. Yeah. Um, I lost my tooth. You lost your tooth. Let me see. Oh, there you go. Very cool. Going to an escape room later today? That'll be fun. I did one of those once. I was horrible at it. I'm sure you'll be way better at it than I was. Yeah. One of the things that my family likes to do uh, for fun at nights, especially when the weather gets a little bit cooler, and I'm look I know you guys are all looking forward to a little bit cooler weather, aren't you? And one of the things that we like to do, especially in the fall and the winter, is have a fire. Do you guys like to have fires? Yeah. Why do you like to have fires? What do you do around the fire? What do you do? Roast marshmallows. There you go. What else? Eat some peanuts. Maybe make some pudgy pies. Have some hot dogs. Just sit around the fire, especially if it's a, a chilly, crisp night and you get to sit around that fire and it's fun. And fires are really neat and they're great and they're wonderful. But what do we know? What's the number one rule about fires, about matches, about lighters and things like this? What's the number one rule about them? We don't touch it. And we don't play with it, right? Fire is not something that we play with. Why don't we play with fire? Because you can burn stuff, yeah. You can burn stuff. And so if you see a fire that's getting out of control or if you saw your brother or your sister playing with fire, what would you do? Tell them to stop, yeah. Tell them to stop because fire can burn. Fire can be dangerous. In the words that we're looking at here today, and I want you to listen to this, when we talk through the sermon, we're talking about how sin is kind of like that. Sin is this dangerous fire. And it's our job to point out that fire when we see it, okay? When we see sin happen, we want to point that out so that way our, our family and our friends don't get hurt by that fire of sin, okay? So will you guys, will you guys do that with me? If you see sin, if you see fire, will you tell that and point that out? Call that out? Because that's what Jesus asks us to do, okay? So let's, let's ask Jesus to help us as we do that. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for taking care of my problem of sin. Thank you for putting it out with your holy, precious blood. Uh, bless me, Lord, as I continue to look for that sin and point it out so others can uh, avoid that hurt too. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, you guys can go sit back with mom and dad. We also, Grace is heading back for nursery. So if you have a child you want for nursery care, otherwise we'll continue our service with our hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. The words for our consideration are taken from our gospel for today, Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to read just one of those verses again. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. This is God's word. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends, ever since he was a little boy, he knew he wanted to be a soldier. But not just any soldier, he wanted to be an American soldier. Rick Rescorla grew up in England and he was in one of the towns that was used by the Allied forces to prep for the D-Day invasion. And so day after day as a young boy, a young English boy, he saw these American troops and he saw their discipline, he saw their uniforms, he saw their courage and he said to himself, I want to be just like them someday. It's all he ever dreamed of. All he ever wanted to be was an American soldier. And eventually, when he grew up with barely any money in his pocket, he came over to the United States and he enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was a good soldier. Very quickly, he rose in the ranks, was promoted to be uh, the leader of his platoon. And shortly after that, uh, he, along with many other of our soldiers, were sent over to fight in Vietnam. His commanding officer, a man named Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, later wrote a memoir about his time in the military, and he included an entire chapter just about Rick. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Moore said that Rick was the best platoon leader I ever saw, and he was amazed at how cool and calm and collected Rick could be, even in the hairiest of situations. There would be times where he would be in this intense gunfire. And, and you know what Rick did to keep the teenagers who were under his command calm? He would sing. He would sing to steady their nerves. He was a decorated soldier. He, he was awarded the Bronze Star, Silver Star, Purple Heart, the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry for his services. And eventually, he left active duty in 1967. He came back to the United States. He taught for a little bit and then became restless. He got kind of bored with that. And then eventually went into working for securities for Morgan Stanley at their offices in New York. Well, just like in, in the military, he rose in the ranks, was ultimately made the head of security, and so that's what he did. He made it his mission to keep their offices there at the World Trade Center safe. And he did that for years and years and years, made that a safe place to work. He was successful at that until, of course, September 11th, 2001. Rick was sitting in the South Tower when he saw the North Tower struck by the plane and uh, a message was broadcasted over the intercom system in the South Tower telling all the workers to stay at their desks and just to remain calm. Well, the seasoned soldier recognized that this was a bad call and so he grabbed his bullhorn and he started going up floor by floor and announcing to everybody that they needed to evacuate the building. And, well, it didn't take long before word circulated that this wasn't some accident, but that this was a deliberate attack. And, of course, panic set in. And Rick remembered, well, what did he do to keep his soldiers calm during a chaotic time? He started to sing in his bullhorn. He started to sing songs like, God Bless America. And some, as they were evacuating the building, joined in. And a hundred got out. Then 500 got out. A thousand, two thousand. And eventually, over 2,700 people got out of the building before the second plane hit. But Rick, Rick recognized there were still many more people in that building that needed to get out. And so what did he do with bullhorn in hand? He ran back up the stairwell 
And he was last seen on the 10th floor of that South Tower, charging into a building when everybody else was sprinting out. This last week, as we observed the 22nd anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, I'm sure you probably heard some similar stories about that day. Stories that are, are moving and inspirational. Stories of bravery and courage and strength. And When I hear stories like that, I, I, I wonder... I wonder, could I muster up the courage to do that? Would that be me? And I, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I hope it would be. And I, I, I pray that it would be. I, I, I pray that God would give me this, the strength to square off with horrific evil and stand my ground. I pray that God would give me the bravery to charge into the face of danger and help people who are hurting and, 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 and go in and get out as many people as I could. I pray that God would give me the strength to do that and the courage to do that. And as I, I was turning also those thoughts over in my head about everything with 9-11 and, 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 and then combining that with the words of our lesson for today, it dawned on me that's actually what Jesus is calling for us to do. He's calling for us to see the burning world around us and see the souls that are caught in these collapsing towers, to, to recognize that and to take action. To go, to go and have that bravery, go and have that courage. See, in the verses leading up to our lesson, the earlier verses of chapter 18 in Matthew's gospel, Jesus has been describing just how deadly and dangerous sin actually is. It's not a joke. It's not something we laugh off. It's not, a, oh, it's no big deal. It's, it's serious. He says things like, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. He says things like, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. You get his point, right? Sin is serious. Sin is deadly. It's got to be avoided. It, it, it's going to collapse your world. And therefore, it's imperative that you who recognize that to take action. And that's where Jesus says to you and to me today, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. This is our call to action. This is our call. Go. You know, if, if, if your mechanic had your car in the shop and he noticed that your brakes were going out, I don't think he's going to say, well, I don't really want to burden him with this bill on his credit card today. I just won't say anything. Right? If you were getting blood work with your doctor and, and she was looking through the results and said, ooh, this, this could be cancer. Your doctor isn't going to say, oh, I, I really don't want to make her sad today. I'm just not going to say anything. Or if you got up in the middle of the night get a drink of water and you notice this orange glow coming through your window and you, you go to take a, a closer look and you open up the blinds and what do you see? You see your neighbor's house starting on fire. You're not going to conclude to yourself, well, they're in, in bed. I don't really want to wake them up and disturb them at this late hour. Or if after church we're all hanging out and you're walking out to your car and as you do, you see some two-year-old toddler running towards rigs with no parent in sight, you're not going to say, well, not my kid, not my job. Why is that? Because we recognize, you know, the mechanic knows if these brakes don't get fixed, multiple people could die as a result of this. 
The doctor recognizes if this cancer is treated, there's a possibility of this person being saved. <laughs> You're not worried about your neighbor missing out on beauty sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning if his house is on fire. And any one of us would run. Even Jim with his cast on his foot, his brace on he'd be sprinting out there as fast as he could if there was a child wandering towards the road. Absolutely give everything we could. Screaming, bloody murder to try and help. So then we look at what Jesus says here today. Something even deadlier than cancer, something even deadlier than a house fire, something as deadly as sin. And he says, it's imperative. You have to go. Go to your brother. Go to your sister. Point out that fault. Why is it? When I pray to God, God, I pray that you'd give me the courage to be like Rick and run into the World Trade Center towers. How come I can't go have that confrontational conversation with someone who's caught with something as deadly as sin? I would guess if we wanted to spend the next six hours here together, we probably could come up with a whole lot of reasons. A whole lot of excuses we've told ourselves and reasons we've justified in our own mind and in our own heart why we don't do that. But maybe just highlight on a, a few common ones. Why don't I? Like any good American, it's none of my business, I say. Now Jesus isn't asking you to wiretap your brother's phone or search your sister's browser history or tail their car or dig through their garbage. That's not my job as a pastor either to be investigating your lives and trying to snoop out and seek out sin in your life. But when it, when it falls in front of my face, when it's right there in the open, when it's blatant and obvious, that's a fire. And Jesus tells me to deal with that. I think to myself, well, you know what? That's not my kid. It's not my job. That's not my responsibility. I'm not the pastor. I'm not the elder. I'm not the brother. Well, clearly, again, Jesus strikes that notion down too. He says, that's exactly who you are. And that's your job. That's your role. We might say to ourselves, number three, I don't want to get them upset. Because I know what's going to happen. I know exactly how the conversation's going to go. Your son is being disrespectful to your wife. Your brother is sleeping with his, his girlfriend. Your sister is dealing with drugs. Your daughter's not going to church. I'm not going to pick that scab open because I know what's going to happen. I know exactly how she's going to react. She's not going to answer my texts. He's going to keep me from seeing the grandkids. He's going to blow up. She's going to chew me out. He's going to cuss me out. I know it's just going to be a fight, and then they're not going to come for Thanksgiving, so I'm just not going to deal with it. There's two issues with that. One, if I conclude to myself, they're just not going to listen. I'm downplaying the power of the Word of God. God tells me his word is powerful. He tells me his word does stuff. And I'm dealing with a brother. I'm dealing with a sister in Christ who knows that, that word of truth. And two, if I say, well, I'm not going to pick that open. I'm not going to pick at that scab. I'm saying, you know what? Sin isn't as serious as Jesus says it is. Again, look how deadly he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye gouge it out, better to have a millstone rather than leading a child into sin. It's, it's serious. Maybe one more, just to think about. And this one is probably the scariest. I don't really love my brother. I don't really love my sister. You know, loving someone is wanting what's best for them and being willing to sacrifice for them and being willing to say, you know what, as uncomfortable as this makes me feel, I'm willing to feel that discomfort because this is what's necessary for you. 
at times I, I shy away and I cower away from that because I just don't like that icky feeling of going and being the one to confront. I, I, I would wager a million dollars, not that I have a million dollars, but I would wager that all of us here in this room would say they don't like doing this. I don't do, like doing this. It's the, I think it's one of the worst things about being a Christian. It's one of the most uncomfortable things about being a pastor. And, and if you feel uncomfortable in doing that, I want you to take heart because you're in good company. <laughs> because God feels the exact same way. God says in Scripture, he, when he talks about admonishing his children, he calls it in Isaiah... It's a strange work, an alien task. God doesn't like to discipline his children because that's not how this relationship is supposed to work. You know, God isn't supposed to be in conflict with mankind, just like parents aren't supposed to be in conflict with their children. That's not how it's supposed to be. Sin disrupts that. And as much as it makes God dislike that work and dislike that job, he says, I do it anyway. Because it's necessary. It's needed. And Jesus, Jesus saw this world headed towards hell. He saw this world crumbling and falling apart. He saw the danger. He saw the fire. And he left the comfort of heaven's throne and came into this world to be singed by sin and death and to wake you and wake me up and point out the danger and get us out of the building. He woke you up and he woke me up to see what he had done. How he had been the one who took on sin and death. How he'd been the one who defeated them. How he was the one who had the courage when I too often cowered. And he was the one who showed me empty cross and empty tomb. Showed me that my sins were forgiven. That my failures and my fears and my worries have been washed away in his blood and paid for. And that, that heaven is mine. And that's, that's really the whole purpose of why we go. It's why we go to our brother, why we go to our sister. Not to shove it in their face and not to belittle them. But so that ultimately, what can we do? We can walk hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder with them, walk them to the foot of the cross and rejoice with them, sins forgiven, and open their eyes to see that life eternal that Jesus has won from this world that's falling apart and celebrate with them again for their forgiveness and our own. You know, I asked you at the beginning of church, what, what, do you, what do you like about being part of a, a church, a, a congregation? And I like all those things too. I like sitting and listening about Jesus and friendship and fellowship. I like that too. But this is one of the crucial things about, about our church, about our congregation. I pray we foster an atmosphere here at peace to do just this. And I, I, I demand this of you as my brothers and sisters in Christ. If you see me caught in a sin, I demand that you point it out to me. I'm sure Paul probably was a little afraid to go and confront Peter. You should never be afraid to come and confront pastor, okay? <laughs> um, come and do that to me because my soul is too important to me. And I would urge you to call on your brothers and sisters to do just that. This is a great reminder. This is something you've asked for as being part of this congregation. You've asked these people in this room to look out for you, to say it is their business when you're going astray. Because you know what? At times, we can become nose deaf to sin. We can have blind spots. We're going to stumble and we're going to fall. And at times, we're going to throw ourselves into the arms of temptation. And we need, we need help. And that's what we're here for. To pick each other up and point each other to the, the cross. And so this is our prayer. I'd ask that you would pray with me. We pray, Oh God, give me the courage, give me the strength to act when sin rears its, its ugly head. 
let me love my brothers and sisters more than myself and, and let that love move me to humbly and gently and patiently point out faults, failures, and sins. And may your holy word crack through hardened hearts so that the good news of sins forgiven can restore, store, restore a broken sinner once again in joy. And, and Lord, should I be the one in need of correction, humble my heart and give me brothers and sisters in my life who will love me enough to speak that truth in love. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And with all that, God's people say amen. Amen. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we have an opportunity to bring our offerings of thanks to the Lord. You can do that by placing it in the basket or by giving online on the church website. Uh, I'd also ask at some point before you leave today, if you haven't filled out one of the connection cards, if you could just take your phone out and scan the QR code that's in the worship folder on page 9, uh, just so you can mark your visit here with us today, and we can follow up to thank you for worshiping with us. Those of you who are joining us online, on Facebook, on YouTube, please uh, share this video with someone who could hear the love of Christ today. With that, then we bring our offerings of thanks. We continue our service then with prayer. O Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. Bless our nation with capable leadership and government. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Bless our students as they grow in their learning and in their appreciation of the many blessings you give us today and always. Give us teachers who promote excellence. Strengthen our families. Give parents a renewed sense of commitment to watch over their children. Give children the wisdom to respect their elders. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear us, and with the faith that you will bless us. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue our service with the singing of our next hymn, O Church Arise.
Please stand for prayer and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Uh, if your kiddos are sticking around for Peace Kids, you can start to make your way in the back with Miss Julie. and We'll close our service with song. Good morning. Welcome once again. Nice to see you here today. Uh, warm welcome to guests and visitors. Nice to have you here. Thanks for coming. Uh, a couple things I want to point out in the service folder on the announcement side of the sheet. Uh, live nativity assistance. Thank you to all the people who came yesterday and worked at the ministry center to prep and get things ready for the live nativity. We're going to be doing that continually here for the next few Saturdays. So if you're available anytime between 10 and 2 to come and do that, that would be uh, much appreciated. Um, and then also the, the, the announcement below that about worship in the property. We're trying to make sure that everybody knows we're going back to the, the tent um, for outdoor worship starting October 8th. And so on Saturday, September 30th, we will need a few hands. Six to eight people would be good to help set up the tent. So talk to Jim about, Jim Neeb about that. He's got his hand up in the back if you're interested in helping with setup. But then uh, everything after service on October 1st we'll be going back over to the property and then first worship service back over there will be on October 8th. Uh, and then I was also asked to announce to uh, Lynn and Gordon Curley are going to be uh, making their way out. If you if you don't know who Lynn and Gordon were or are, are uh, they're, they're former members here. Uh, they have since moved to Iowa but they're coming out for a visit October 22nd uh, and are looking if anybody's interested and you want to get together, catch up with the Curleys. Um, they're going to be having uh, kind of getting 
people out at uh, Santan Flat and Santan Valley. So there is a sign-up sheet with information of that on one of the high top tables. Otherwise, you can talk to uh, Julie Neeb if you have any questions about that. But uh, everything else is in the, in the announcement sheet. If you have any questions, let me know. But uh, thank you to everybody who helped set up and, and snacks and everything and, and ushering and, and music and everything for today. Um, I, I, you really are in my prayers, and, and I hope I'm in yours too, that God give you the strength and the courage uh, to speak up because it's not an easy thing. And that's one of the great things about being part of a church family is that we have this encouragement from each other uh, to, to encourage each other to do just that, to, to take a firm stand on the word of God and speak the truth and love. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm right here at your side with you praying for you. And I hope you're praying for me that I do the same, uh, that we stand on that truth. Because um, the devil's going to do everything he can to try and cover that up. And he's going to do everything he can to try and give us every excuse in the book. Um, but it's imperative that we do so. God's opened our eyes to see, and, uh, and may he give us that courage then to speak that truth as well. So have a great week. I hope you can stick around for Bible study. We're continuing our series on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, if I, I don't see you next week, uh, or if I don't see you before next week, we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.